Well, welcome and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Key Metrics in Major Giving Fundraising. We've got quite a large group on the webinar. I guess that's an indication that this is a topic that there's a lot of interest in and really matters to the, uh, the industry. This webinar is going to last about 30 minutes and then we'll follow it up with a question and answer period. So if you have questions, the best way is to put them in the chat or the question on the go to webinar panel over on the right side of your screen. So I'm Doug Cogswell. I'm the President and CEO of Advisor Solutions. We do a ton of work in data analytics across a variety of sectors. Uh, we have a big practice in fundraising, uh, education, uh, healthcare, not-for-profits, uh, membership-based, 200 plus fundraising clients. And what I'll be sharing today is results from just working with major giving teams and using data to help see best stories, call out you know, best practices and help the team perform better. As we get into this, I really feel uh, we need to start with a key premise because often metrics become kind of like standards and good and bad measures. And we actually really strongly feel they need to be positioned as coaching tips because the data and the metrics tell stories and we'll go through some of them in this half hour, which highlight best practices. If you're trying to understand that, some field officers, some team members are going to be doing things better than others, and that's great. And those can be used to highlight what's working interactively with teams. We find this works the best, and those coaching tips help the others sort of step up and understand and learn and, and improve their performance. And these really should not be the thou shalts or the thou should not. Uh, these are not good or bad thresholds when they're used most effectively. They're things that help tell a story, and you know sometimes it might be the actual rating levels are wrong, or you know, it's not the field officer is not doing a good job, it's the ratings are wrong, or they're the wrong prospects, or it calls out some discussion about the situation. So let's, let's take a look. High level, uh, we see two levels of focus out there across our client base. You know, there's teams and um, there's a, quite a few of them that really measure development officer activities. Another way of looking at this is prospect cultivation. And, I think the two are actually quite different because you can manage a team to activity levels but not effectively bring a pool of prospects from here to there. Uh, here being you know, initially identified, not qualified, there being significant donors. And we're going to go through development officer activities and look at you know, kind of how we typically see them being used, how they could be used better, but then switch to a much more strategic view of a portfolio focused on cultivating prospects, not managing field officer activities. So typically, a lot of our clients measure development officer activities, and this would be a typical chart. It's got a list of the field officers. Visits fiscal year to date seems to be the primary one. Visits last month, contacts fiscal year to date, contacts last month. And the problem with this is it's multiple fold, but if it's September, it's really hard to know are these good or bad. And by June, it kind of is a year, and then they reset to zero. And so we're going to just follow three field officers through different ways of looking at activities. So Daniel Asnes, if you look at visits fiscal year to date, he's done 31. John Brown's done 37, and kind of a bunch of contacts too. And Kimberly Lloyd's done 19. Uh, by the way, it looks like there may be a data glitch here, which we often see. Um, looks like we've got Kim and Kimberly. Uh, these probably should be combined. You know, in a front-end tool like ours, you could do it here or clean up the database. But we'll take it that she's done 19. So I'm looking at this. I'd say John Brown's doing a pretty good job. Daniel's doing uh, good as well. And Kimberly's not quite as good. Hard to measure, though, because you don't know what the level should be. So what we recommend is adding, if you're going to look at activities, visits in the last 12 months, unique visits in the last 12 months, and then the same thing with the context. Look at them over a moving 12-month period, which wipes out cyclicality because you've got you know, the same periods in both years. It's normalized because it's always the same time period, and you're getting a much more accurate measure of what's happening to the prospects, because the prospect doesn't know it's your fiscal year, that is August. You know, they just know kind of in general that the number of contacts over a year matters, and it helps build momentum. And if you look at, in this case, um, you know, John's doing great. He's got 104. And Daniel's got 78, and you might conclude, you know, Kimberly's are actually not doing very well. And you can show it graphically, graphical view of that same chart really you know, sets some standards. And generally, in a 12-month period, we're seeing, you know, 75 to 125 in-person visits. Under 75, 
probably the low side. It's hard to, if you're doing over 125, you're probably uh, doing not a lot more than doing visits. So in that range, and you can quickly see uh, Daniel's in it, uh, John's uh, really pushing it hard, uh, second to um, uh, Gretchen, and it looks like Kimberly's having some problems. Another way to look at this, though, is unique visits. So if you look at it that way, so this is, you know, John's done 104 visits, but only with 41 people. So he's actually below the threshold of 50. So Daniel's got 78 and 71 pretty good. And Kimberly, uh, 48 total visits, but she's actually visited 39 people. So what's up with John Brown? And we see this is a lot. If the metric is visits, uh, he's doing it. Uh, he's had 17 visits with Cortez and 16 with Floyd. And maybe, you know, often they may not be the top prospects, but he knows them well. So he's figured this out, and he's getting the visits in. Um, and he's kind of gone down the list there. So, you know, that's kind of... Looking at that, you can make it better by going to a 12-month cycle versus fiscal time periods, but it still raises the question, is this really strategic? Because these kinds of measures we see often drive discussions around these artificial time periods that the prospects don't care about, and this is not the way they think. It also drives anecdotal stories about the recent visits. You know, we sit in on field officer reviews, and often it's, you know, I had this great visit with Joe at dinner on Wednesday, and here's what came out. And then I had, you know, with Sue two weeks earlier. So you're getting these stories, but they're out of context of the whole portfolio pool. And the other thing it measures is the development officer's visits, but what about engaging others to visit? So if I own, you know, 100 prospects and I've got the dean going in, the president going in, if it's a healthcare, you know, the, one of the providers talking to the prospects, shouldn't that count? Why is it just the visits I make? It actually might be better if I effectively engage other people to help cultivate and bring along my clients. And the other thing that really ought to be is what about the prospects who weren't visited? Who are they? Uh, why haven't they visit, been visited? What's their potential? So we like to flip this around and those visits are fine and they're part of the whole program, but really focus on prospect pool, pool cultivation. And we're going to look at six dimensions of this. Assigning the right prospects, we're going to do that quickly, and making sure the pool is penetrated because if I have 100 prospects, and typically numbers are 75 to maybe 150 is a good prospect assignment level, if I have 100, I ought to be getting in contact with 80% of them in a year. If I'm not, we ought to look at what's going on. I mean, maybe I've got the wrong prospects, or maybe I'm over-focusing on 20 of them and leaving you know, the rest of the other 80 just sitting there. But if they're assigned, that means they're valuable, uh, and they ought to be identified and, and screened in or out discussing the prospects who haven't been contacted. So you know, it's not just the ones I'm going to, but what about the ones I haven't? Who are they? Making, uh, the, helping the prospects and making sure they're moving across stages because if they're not progressing, and generally we like to work with five stages. Uh, they could be called different things, but you know, qualification, cultivation, solicitation, and then moving through the closed stages. And there ought to be motion, and there's time levels to this. We'll see this in a minute. Then soliciting at the right dollar level. So if I have a bunch of lower capacity prospects and I've got you know $10 million uh, solicitation pool out there, that could be awesome. But if I've got all the high rated prospects, that actually could be really low. So we need to uh, look at the context there. And we've seen just that example at a client where there was a lot of excitement about a million dollar pending close and it flagged red in one of our, our dashboards. It flagged red because this was a $25 million prospect who was highly engaged and had already given $7 million. And it calculated a factor of a, of a $14 to $15 million potential uh, ask. So it, maybe that's high, maybe $1 million is low, but at least it drives a discussion. So you have the key to say, you know, let's talk about this. Maybe that prospect should be um, solicited for a naming for some program or some, some dorm or something. And let's see if we can get this up. So this drives that kind of discussion. Then obviously closing solicitations uh, does no good if the asks are made and then not closed. So let's step through these. Um, prospect assignments, the question is, are all of our highest capacity and most engaged prospects staffed? And are the pools reasonably sized? Um, penetration, is our pool of assigned prospects being connected with? Movement. Are we moving prospects forward at a reasonable pace? Solicitation levels. Are our asks at the right level relative to capacity and attachment and yield? Are we closing solicitations at an aggressive level? We find um, if you manage a program to these kinds of things, we have clients that are 
getting uh, closes done substantially faster, uh, average times dropping from, say, 36 months down to the 24-month range, uh, higher numbers of million-dollar-plus donations uh, because you're focusing on these things, and uh, faster qualification in or out. So the, the net effect here is you know, more revenue faster, which is obviously the name of the game. So there's obviously some key benefits to getting this right and managing the pool as a pool. And these are you know, kind of measures and metrics and techniques that are used in industry and any kind of consultative uh, selling, which is what this really you know, is very similar to. So let's look at unassigned high priority prospects. This is data uh, disguised from a client. Uh, we see this a lot. So this is pie chart is looking at a wedge that's the unassigned high capacity and engaged prospects. And here's the assigned. And generally we see there's often a significant pool of high capacity, highly engaged prospects who aren't assigned. And here we're color coded by the capacity. So the red is 50 million or more. A little pinkish color, whatever, fuchsia, I'm not great with colors, is 10 to 50 million and goes down. And the green is uh, 500 to a million. So everybody here is a capacity of at least half a million. And this can come from wealth screening scores or wealthy. There's a variety of ways of getting these things. So let's assume we have it. Then the attachment scores. We recommend calculating this, and we have other webinars on this, so I'm not going to go into detail. But this is a combination. The owners are going to be people who have been to, if it's a school, all the reunions. You know, they've given consistently. They've participated on committees. Uh, the engaged less so, and the levels under this, the disconnected and detached, have not done that. You know, we do work in healthcare where it's, it's, it's uh, maybe the intensity of the procedures, the type of procedure, the follow-on activities. So the, what goes into these things are different. but. What you want to make sure is that the engaged, highly engaged owners who are also high capacity are staffed. And this would justify you know, adding a few more staff. Um, maybe you qualify these and not all of them get assigned. But you want to make sure uh, you don't have a big pool uh, of unassigned. Then when they're assigned, um, you know, this is uh, a team. And we like to see 100 to 150 assigned prospects. That level is also the kind of level you'll see in consultative sales, uh, in consulting firms, or across industry. So that's a normal level of roughly how many prospects that person can interact with in a reasonable way. Uh, if you push it much higher than the 150, it's really hard. And you could argue there's some really high level uh, of, the, of the pyramid where you might want to cut this back because it's much more consultative, longer close cycle. But on average, this is what we're dealing with. And this is not in a, this is a typical uh, scenario we'll see where there's a whole group of like uh, Joseph Haber, uh, Justina have way too many prospects. You can see by the coloring, um, the green is the 500 to a million. So if I was running this team, I'd think about rebalancing and maybe getting some of these off. Because what happens is that Joseph has 265 prospects and he's trying to penetrate it. He can't. And you know he ought to be focusing on the higher capacity, highly engaged prospects. And then uh, these ones can be put into a an unassigned pool and you know, push the wedge on the prior page bigger, but then we kind of worry about later. But it's really hard for somebody to be effective with these numbers. So that's the, the first point. Let's make sure we got all of the high capacity, highly engaged prospects assigned and assigned at reasonable levels. Then we want to look at penetration. I'll describe what's on this page. But generally, we, we like to look at uh, five levels of penetration. So the blue, they have an active proposal in front of them, uh, a solicitation, and they've been visited in the last 12 months. That's the kind of the highest level of, of penetration. And you can sort of see over here, we'll come back to this chart, but that's the blue over here as well. Uh, the, the next level, they have a proposal, an active solicitation, but they actually have not been visited in the last 12 months. You might ask why, but there's a variety of reasons why that might be the case, because there's a lot of email and phone dialogue going on. The third level. Um, this was this kind of olive green. They've been visited in the last 12 months, but don't have a solicitation. And this uh, kind of orange fuchsia color is they've been contacted in the last 12 months in some meaningful way. This means if there's a there's an email dialogue or there's a phone conversation, not I sent an email, they never replied. So data validity here matters. And the gray is they have no proposal and no contact in the last 12 months. And just what this is, so here's a field officer, Heather Ashford. Um, so she has 143 assigned prospects. She's in a reasonable band. And she has had one of these four levels of penetration with 112 of them. So she's at 78.3%. The band here is 70 to 80%. You want to see people in that range with these measures. So looking at this pool, um, 
there's an awful lot of gray here, uh, which is uncovered, and there's an awful lot of field officers. Kimberly Lloyd, for example, um, you know, it, it, we were looking at her earlier. She's actually doing okay with unique visits, but she's way under on penetration. The caller starts telling you why. Uh, looks like the green is you know, kind of her visits. Uh, this is contacts other than visits. You can see that's a little lower than some of these up here, and see she's really got no solicitation. So I'm starting to get an understanding of Kimberly Lloyd and how she's working with her pool. Um, unique visits is kind of, oh, she's right near the threshold, but solicitations are low and, and other kinds of meaningful contacts are low. You know, Heather's doing great. Um, let's look at the others. John Brown, he's, he's right at the level. He's doing well in this level of penetration. Uh, the other one, Daniel, uh, we were looking at is, is doing pretty good. Um, and it runs down. So this would drive two discussions. Uh, why are some of these low and what's going on? I mean, it might be that these are just bad prospects. They should be reassigned. It might be that, you know, Kimberly's having trouble getting uh, into the later stages and actually getting a solicitation out. Um, but it's, it's at least a rich discussion. Some of these, like uh, Michael Leahy, you can see the thickness here. He's one of those big bars on the prior one. He needs his pool cut back because he, he's not going to get it penetrated because he's got too many. Um, so now we've looked just one level down. We took off the just contact, and we're looking at the, you know, has the proposal and visited, the proposal not visited, the visit. So this is a more active engagement. You want to see this uh, at 50% ideal, 40 to 50% is, is kind of normative. And, um, yeah, the, uh, and the, uh, it runs down. So you've got, you know, this level, a whole bunch here that you start having some discussions with. And you look at John Brown is also doing well up here. Daniel fell off uh, because his overall penetration level was good with the contacts, but it's less good with the visits and the solicitation. And we already talked about Kimberly Lloyd. So there's you know a lot of a lot of stories come out of this, and you're starting to get the the text for a discussion. And there's actually just a question: What are the green and the red lines and this in the prior chart? The green is the target you want to reach, and the red is kind of minimum threshold. Um, and if you start a program like this, this is pretty normal. And people don't know what the metrics are. They haven't been managing to it. So you've got a, a lot that are under the red line. You know, one of the other questions that came in is, is how long does it take to actually get something like this up and running? You know, the data usually pretty quick, but to get the team's behavior to change, it can take a couple years. So you'd like to see this evolve over time, and if you come back, a year or two later, uh, less gray and, uh, and more action. But this penetration concept is getting you away from just measuring the visits to measuring the cultivation of, of a team. And I want to point out again, like Heather's penetration here includes the actions by Heather plus others. So if she's got the VP, the dean, others engaged in her accounts, or if it's a healthcare, you know, you've got primary providers engaged or whomever the other relationship people could be, that counts because it's not you're trying to help Heather get her prospect pool to a close on a solicitation, not just to have visits. And it's, you know, it might be better if Heather did less visits and solicited others to help her. So that's a fundamental concept. And you know, we do a bunch of work in this area. I think many of you know we, we're pretty close with Marts and Lundy. We work back and forth. And you know, kind of the two of us would totally reinforce this message that the penetration needs to be described this way. So movement. Uh, so what's this chart? Uh, this is the next concept. Uh, this is time from you know today to 42 months out in this case, and these are different uh, stages. So a prospect will start in qualification, move up to cultivation, move to solicitation, verbal commitment, and pending close. And you know this, these can vary, um, but there ought to be five or so of them. We've got one client who had open and close. That's not enough to see motion, and somebody had 15 of these things. And with 15, the, the field officers, nobody can distinguish between level 7A and 7B. So five is a good number. And uh, you know, what each of these bubbles is, this, this big red one here is uh, the prospect is Sammy Keneally. Tracy Roberts is the staff that owns that prospect. There's no title. It's a $10 million. Um, this is, this is pre-solicitation, so it's an estimated, uh, estimated ask. And it's been in cultivation 20 months, which is you know, the end of the, the extreme here. So uh, you want to see motion through this. Um, when you see a lot of things down in here, it starts raising you know, questions about why are there prospects stuck down there in qualification and, and who owns them and, and whatnot. 
So let's take a look. Uh, with an interactive tool, uh, you could just grab a mouse and sweep over these prospects who have been in cultivation uh, qualification over six months. I mean, it should be fairly quickly to move out of that stage into the next. And these are clearly compared to the rest of the team taking longer. We'll come to this chart more in a minute. It's called the heat map. So I'm showing the concentration of the estimated ask um, compared to the whole pool. So what this would say is uh, down here, Tally Goldman, it looks like 90% like of her pool in terms of dollar value has been in qualification over six months. That would raise a flag, probably start a discussion. Why aren't these things moving? How do we get them to cultivation? What's the next steps? Uh, Tracy Roberts, um, the VP, the same thing. Uh, Tracy's got a lot of her pool down here. Um, we often see this because often the VP is assigned too many of the top prospects and can't effectively get to them all. And usually it's a justification for moving the pool smaller on that person and reassigning out. But this is fairly typical where we see you know, imbalances in the pool like this. And I know, you know most of you, uh, most of the CRM systems you know, can track the timing in these stages. And if you're not using them, and not all of our clients are effectively at the beginning, uh, you know, there's Razor's Edge, Blackbud, Lucian, uh, the vendors can all help you get the prospects timing and staging into the system. We're, we're, we can help you get it out in forms like this where you can work with it and see stories. So now let's switch and look for a minute at uh, solicitation levels. Um, this is called a heat map. And it's now all the prospect pool. And it's sized by the sum of the ask amount um, for the solicitations. And it's colored by the ask to uh, what we call the current year expected value. So we're calculating something out of the capacity rating of each prospect in their engagement. So if somebody's got a capacity of a million bucks and they're highly engaged, you know, that might be an estimated uh, amount, uh, expected value of $300,000. If they're a million dollars and they're disconnected, you know, that might be $15,000. Because you're not going to get, if they're disconnected, you're highly unlikely to get that bigger amount out of them, at least at the beginning. You've got to cultivate them and get them more engaged. So this is what, why you kind of know, for example, you know, Nancy's got a big pool and it's green. So she's got, a, say, $60 million of, of ask out there. And it's a good ratio compared to her uh, expectations. Whereas John Brown, you saw he was actually penetrating his pool pretty well. Um, is, is orange, which means he's down in this range where his coverage, we call it the coverage ratio, is not as good as it should be. And you kind of see structurally I've got some problems over here with some of my satellite programs where they're actually not getting asked out at a good level. And they're bright red, which means they're really low compared to the expected value. You know, Francesca Peachtree jumps here. She's bright green. Uh, why is that? Well, she's obviously got less solicitation than Nancy or John, but she must have lower capacity prospects, and therefore she, her coverage ratio for what you'd expect is really good. So uh, let's take a look um, at John Brown. So John Brown flagged here as red, which means he's probably under asking. If we go back and just look at his prospects on this uh, stage moves chart, he's now colored in blue. What you see is doing an awesome job of moving them through the stages. You know, he's in blue. The rest of the pool is in gray. He's got all of the big ones out of qualification. He's got a couple of little ones. This little one's been there 10 months. They go through cultivation. Uh, they're hitting solicitation, going through that quickly. Verbal commit happens fast. He's got a couple of big ones now that are impending close. So John, we've been sort of staying with him. Uh, he's got a lot of visits. He's got good penetration. He's moving things through really well, but it looks like he may be under asking. And so if I'm with John, that's going to be my coaching tips. And maybe he's the guy we talked about earlier, the client, where he's got a $1 million pending close and really should be 14. And that would flag in something like this, and that's the discussion you'd have. John, how can you get this thing up? I mean, it looks to us like it should be $14 million. He might say it can't be because of this and that and the other thing, and maybe then say, well, could we do five and try to get him engaged in this? And so that's the that's discussion you want to have. And you know, it's highlighting that John's issue is potentially under asking. Another way of looking at this, and this is disguised data, um, but you look at these coverage ratios. So the question is, what should they be? We expect to see three times, which is what the heat map, the green color is. Here's the pool. Um, you know, some people out here with really high ask to expected ratios, but there's a big group down here, like half the, half the group that's well under two, and some of them are really low. So this is the kind of distribution we see. Um, we also then when we look at yields, which is the, the last point, 
in the uh, the line up here of metrics. This group, uh, very strong, 243 million is accepted out of 7 to 18 acids. One third of the acids is accepted and 20 to 30 percent is typical. This is good, but some of the acids are low versus the expected value. We saw that on the prior page and you can sort of see on the range, generally this entire team is, is doing well on this, this yield of you know 20 to 30 percent. There's a few at the bottom of this, but these guys are all doing well. But it's the combination that matters. So if I'm on this team, I just highlighted, um, and they're listed down here, you can see in the bars, these are the people with high ash to expected ratio, all over three, who also have yields over 20%. You can see there's like, it's like six or eight of them. So the best practice is these guys and gals are doing it. And in a team meeting, to put this data up and have a discussion and have them talk about how they're doing this because it's different. Uh, there's only six or eight of them doing this. And the learnings and the lessons then gets transferred to the rest of the team. And that's the kind of coaching tips and using the best practices to highlight that can then bring the rest of the team along because you want people focused on this. And this is this is a win. This is more revenue. Uh, this is much better donor cultivation. And on any team, you're going to get a distribution like this. And the bold thing is to use this in front of the team and have those kinds of discussions. So you know, what's strong performance in one of these things? Um, Kind of, we went through some examples, and those are disguised real examples, and you can sort of see the spreads. Is this doable? It is, and, and you know, a strong performance would be 100 to 150 active assigned prospects. Um, over that's probably more than a person can reasonably cover. Um, 70 to uh, 75 to 120 in-person visits per year, and a moving 12-month period, not a fiscal. Well, obviously the end of the fiscal year is the same as the moving 12-month period, but most of you start July 1, so right now it's, you know, that's, that's that whole discussion. But that's a reasonable level. 70% um, plus penetration, and we talked about that, it's from a ownership perspective, so it's your visits plus other people you engaged. Six to 18 months in the stage, and the chart before the we went through qualification. Over six months in qualifications is getting kind of long. Some of those other stages, cultivation, you know, solicitation, you know, 18 months is more normal. So the you can see on the chart that the length in the stage varied, but you can actually just pick off the you know the outliers, the exceptions, and and that's where the discussion begins because some people are moving through the stages, you know, in 12 to 18 months. Why are they getting stuck? What's happening here? approximately 25 active proposals at any time. So out of this pool, it's like 25% should be in solicitation. You want to see the ask to expected value at a 3 plus X ratio. And here we're for the field officer. We're summing the active asks amounts. And we're comparing it to three times this calculation of the expected amount, which is a, a mathematical calculation off the capacity and the attachment scores. We have another webinar that talks about that in more detail. And then uh, typically you're going to close, you know, if you've got 25 out, you're going to close 8 to 10. You might close a third of them in, uh, at the active ones. So it's like 8 to 10 proposals close per fiscal year. And this is caveated after a first year ramp up. Obviously, if you hire somebody in the first six months, they're not going to do this. They need ramp up time. So higher ed focus, healthcare, not for profits, it may vary a little bit. But these numbers, they actually do stand up because if you look at consultative selling in industry, uh, you know, consulting strategy consulting firms, and I used to work for one, you know, these guys set kind of the same level. So these you can quibble with these, uh, but the kind of in this range is good. So uh, what do you do with these again? Um, you know, we start out by talking about they drive coaching tips. Um, Development officer, operating plans, comparison to metrics, stories that lead to best practices and coaching tips. In reviews, group discussions of best practices, focus on the pool strategies, the team works to improve subpar performance. Generally, when this works well, these kinds of you know, discussions happen at least twice a year. And they're, when they work well, there's openness, there's transparency. You might have 10 field officers in the room with the manager and probably some analysts who can run the data if questions come up. And there's a very open discussion, and people are trying to understand, not defensively, but how do those eight people do this? How did they get these high coverage ratios and high close rates? You know, what did they do? How did you get 80% of your pool penetrate? I'm stuck. I, I'm, I'm stuck in qualification, I'm, and I'm not getting the meetings. Like, what's up? How did you do this? Those are the discussions, and you know, the results are 
uh, phenomenal when it works. I mean, you use improve the cycle time, you increase the yields, you increase the number of million dollar plus donations, and you get more revenue. And you know, the data thing always comes up. Uh, often when we start these projects, you know, people are well. We had one where the proposals there was two spikes. Uh, they were all going in the system on June 30th and December 31st. So, you know, the visits all go in at the end of the quarter because that's when people measure them. Then the metrics become, you know, time to get a contact report filed or, you know, time to get a proposal inputted into the system. And you can put that up in a bar chart. And like, if somebody's consistently running way over everybody else, that'll self-correct. Um, so yeah, the things we ran through assumes that the data is going in the system, but you know, we, as I said, will change the the goals or the metrics, and the coaching tips will become around. How do you get the contact report filed quickly versus uh, what's your penetration level? Then it shifts to penetration. And there was a question on timing. So if the data is not going in the system regularly, and that process can take a year because management's got to pass the vision for why it's important. There needs to be some metrics on getting the data in the system. That needs to be shared with the team so people realize it's not cool, it's not OK to put my contact reports in all at the end of the quarter because we're trying to run this thing and we're using this to get better. So in some cases is a year to get the data working right. And then once the data is right, it's like another year to get these kinds of behaviors. If you're shifting from a field officer you know, activities to a prospect pool cultivation mindset, you've got to shift the whole team. And that, that's a year. And it needs senior management involvement. It needs to be in the meetings with the field officers. And the concept has to be the data tells stories and helps highlight best practices. If people, if they get fearful that I'm going to get like nailed because my coverage ratio is 35% and 50%, that's not the point. Um, they ought to feel excited that they're going to be in this discussion where best practices are going to share it and they're going to uh, learn how to do better. So that's, uh, we reached the half hour point and we're looking for questions. Somebody asked, a very tactical question, what software do we use? Well, Advisor Solutions is a software and services company, so it's our software. We're one of the leaders in data discovery software tools. And in this particular sector, we also have business consultants who are really good at taking data from whatever it's in. Often it's straight from the you know, not so well formatted source system tables and structuring it so it does this. And we're partners with uh, Agilon and Elucian and Blackbaud uh, in this market, as well as Marston and Lundy, so we're pretty well represented. And we've got a, I mentioned like 200 plus clients who we work with on these kinds of problems. How would the software interface with our database? And there's another question, we use Millennium. Yeah, we have a number of Millennium accounts as well. Um, we load, so the, that's a technical question, we load data from databases. So you know, Millennium's typically in SQL Server, uh, some of the others are in Oracle, uh, some of them are in Unidata, so whatever it is. We're loading uh, Millennium, if that's the question, you know, typically it's 30 to 80 or 100 tables depending how well formatted they are. Um, so you know, to do this, we obviously need the entity table. Uh, we need the contacts table, and we need to. We can then split it into visits, and visits last 12 months. We can do all that calculation in our world uh, if it's not done in the database. Um, we obviously need the proposals table. We need the prospects table with the date stamps. Uh, sometimes that's in Excel. Uh, if it's it is, we can also grab you know Excel access tables that may not be in the database. But we're effectively an in-memory mart where we're grabbing this data from wherever it comes from, and then structuring and synthesizing it so it goes into the form we just walked through. And you know we will also help a team take this into meetings, and we can kind of be the one to catch the heat, but kind of drive the discussion and try to bring this up out of you know metrics into these coaching stories. Uh, what are some of the ways in which your clients track the time and stage? Do you have any examples? Uh, yeah, so it depends on what CRM system you use. Uh, like a Lucy in Advance has a pretty well formatted prospect table where you can put stages in and let you put a start and an end date on it. Uh, Razor's Edge uh, pretty much has the um, start date. It's got one of the dates, but not 
both. So we've got clients who are actually put the prospects in the actions table where you can put a start and end date on it. Um, Millennium's pretty good with this. It varies by system, but most of the systems um, do that. The most sophisticated version of this we saw was uh, a well-known uh, leading technology uh, institution in the U.S. wrote their own front end. So the, it was a mobile-based contact input. So you'd have a meeting with somebody and you'd tap a bunch of things and you could put some text in and then the system would determine from the nature of the contact if the prospects should be restaged and would put that in the system with the rationale and the dates. And um, as it was completely automated, it's really cool. We have uh, an industry, you know, there's some, a lot of people use Salesforce uh, in industry, and there's um, clients there, consulting firms, law firms, that will do the same thing. They'll have a set of criteria that if they get hit, it automatically restages. And most of our fundraising clients manually stage. Um, some of them have prospect research overseeing. So the field officer does something. It then goes to prospect research for approval to make sure it actually happened. <laughs> Uh, not to say that it doesn't always actually happen, but sometimes it might not. So there's like a sometimes there's a validation process that goes on as well. Um, but yeah, if you're going to use this stuff, it actually has to be real. And if the prospect's in cultivation, the prospect ought to be in cultivation. And for that to happen, there have, have to have been some meetings, there have to have been some discussions. There should be some comments about you know what this person's interested in and what will, what it will take to uh, bring them uh, over the line. Does penetration mean a visit, or do you other types of contacts count as penetration? Ah, uh, good question. I'm going to actually flip back to those two charts. Uh, so this, so you both. So you know, penetration. We kind of look at here uh, with this. I don't know, call it brown fuchsia being uh, contacted in the last 12 months. Other than a visit, this is like a hierarchy. If they have a proposal and been visited, they go and they go in one of these buckets. Uh, proposal not visited, they go here. Visited, last 12 months, no proposal, they go here. If they've had none of these but have been contacted in some meaningful way means, again, there has to have been, if it's a phone call, actually a conversation, not I left a message, uh, they go here. Um, so yes, and that's uh, this target where it's, you know, um, here's the 80% line and here's the 70% line. They ought to be in that range. Um, you can kind of see they're kind of picking it up here. And then here's, if you drop off, the non-visit contacts, uh, you know, the, the range drops, and you look at it that way. So basically, you do want to look at it two ways because, you know, ultimately penetration doesn't have to be a visit. If it's a meaningful phone conversations and an email dialogue, and you're moving somebody, you know, from um, cultivation to solicitation, that's fine. And I know me, I, I probably would prefer to have the phone conversations because I just having more meetings is not the thing I most like. So early on, yeah, qualification, is somebody's got to sit down and sort the thing out. But as you move along, um, you know, this. So you got to look at it both ways, I think would be my answer to that. What is the difference between a unique visit and just a visit? Great question. So I'm going to go back to that chart, um, wherever it was. It was back here. So um, John Brown, in a 12-month period, had 104 visits. That's literally taking the contact table and summing how many visits he had. Unique visits means um, take the first visit in that 12-month period and don't count the others. So that ends up being how many people he visited in that 12-month period. Uh, so the 41, um, you can obviously see the first visit in that 12-month period that Cortez counts, the other 16 don't. You know, the first visit the Floyd counts, the other 15 don't. So the difference between these two numbers is the take off 16, take off 15, take off 5, and you have knocked 104 down to 41. So that's how many people he's visited with in the 12-month period versus how many visits he made. And this kind of highlights the, the difference. Another question. What constitutes someone having an active proposal for your terms? Is that equal to solicitation? Yeah, so let's move over here. Uh, so. This chart, uh, if you notice, has uh, proposal ask amounts even down at cultivation. And, and obviously at this level, they've, it's like I've got, the charts aren't syncing with, okay, hold on, we're having a little technical glitch here where the charts are running behind. Uh, well, I'm on, 
I'm on the, the timetable uh, chart, which is the one with the, all the little bubbles. And on the cultivation level, um, on the right, there's a brush up that shows somebody in cultivation with a $10 million proposal ask amount. Obviously, that's not an actual ask because it's only in cultivation. So some of the CRM systems let you put in a, an estimated ask, uh, an anticipated ask, an actual ask, and then a you know, grant amount. So there can be the proposal can move from different stages. So ideally, you do want to put a number on even the qualification, the cultivation stage levels, because you want to see where's the money coming from. And then as they move up into you know solicitation, they become an actual ask. So the looking at the yields, uh, we're looking at the actual. We're looking at the grants to the actual asks. When we're looking here, uh, we're putting money on the cultivation, the qualification by an estimated or whatever the systems call it different things. Um, and I know not all the systems do that. Some of them, let you, you can just put it in when you actually make the formal ask. Um, but we, we really like the concept of managing this through the pipeline and um, looking at, but this is telling us something, I'm looking at the You've got an awful lot of potential money sitting down here in qualification. These, these circles are big because they're like that, that 10 million uh, potential ask level. Uh, you can actually see by the time they get up here, I've got the verbal commits a lot of smaller stuff. And it looks like there's some really small dots. So people may not be putting it. Or maybe there's older data. They didn't put this data in the system back then. But you know, I've got an awful lot of weight down here, which is why we like it that way. At what point should prospects move into solicitation? Is it only after they have been asked, or is it when they are about to be asked? Yeah, that's we see that both ways, but you know, generally, you know, solicitation is when the process of asking is happening. So at the end of cultivation, uh, you you know uh, what the person's interest is, you know how much the proposal should be. And you're now in the process of putting it down. I think most of the systems will track it into solicitation when it's actually a, a proposal goes in the system and it's something you are then putting in front of somebody. The time, you know, so the time boundaries, obviously there's a the end of cultivation, the beginning of solicitation. There's some variance between teams and systems, but I think the concept is, is clear. I'm confused about expected value. What is it and why? We want a gift officer to ask three times the value. Okay, so the idea of expected value. Um, so let's let's go back over here. So um, for a prospect, and there's a whole way we have a whole other webinar on this. So I'll, I'll do the the Cliff Notes version. There. Um, capacity ratings that usually will look something like this. So you can monetize these, like if it's 10 to 50 million, we would generally go a third of the way into the range. So you know, it's like $18 million is what would go for that. You know, the, the one to five million would be like 2.5 or $2 million or something in that range. So you monetize the capacity because that's how much dollars it should be worth. And it's a number. Everybody gets a number. And these attachment scores, um, there's also a factoring number at the front. An owner is 0.3, a highly engaged is 0.2, and engaged is 0.5, and there's categories under this, like detached is like 0.01 or 0.02 or something. So there have been some studies done um, by a number of the consulting firms that are trying to, and you can do this with your own data as well, although most of our clients don't have the attachment scores back in time when grants are made, but there's a relationship, a mathematical relationship between these levels and these levels, which is how you get for a person an expected value. So a, uh, a one to five million capacity, let's say, for sakes of argument, that's worth $2 million. And then they're an owner. So $2 million times 0.3 is um, $600,000 is the expected amount for that prospect. If they're engaged, it's 0.15 times 2 million or $300,000, so it's less. And if you went down the rankings, it could be all the way down to like $30,000. So that's the idea of, and this, you know, financial service, other industries where they do this. And in fact, Salesforce does the same thing for commercial deals, where you're factoring the staging times the value and creating an expected value. So that's the concept that every you can estimate a, a, a giving amount for every person. The next concept is uh, in this three-year thing is not everybody. 
not that expected value does not come in from everybody every year. Uh, so there's a liquidity factor. So if I have an expected value of a million dollars and I'm illiquid, you know, I might give that out over 20 years. Uh, if, if I'm extremely liquid, I just sold my business, that might be this year. So the expected value has to be, in terms of if you're looking at a pool and some's coming this year, some's coming next year, you have to create a value for this year. So you basically need to take it and divide it by something. Um, most of our clients don't have liquidity factors. Um, if you did, you could scale it because somebody might be one, somebody might be 20, somebody might be 10. And generally, uh, if that's not done, we would divide the entire, all of them by five or seven. There's a range in there. We do some, some matching to see what happens. But that's an average liquidity factor saying that that million dollars, you know, you're likely to get in over seven million dollars, seven years if it's real. So now you have a pool value, which is in any given year, um, that's how much you'd expect to get. Uh, you know, you've got all these, that 10 people, each with a million dollar expected value. The total of that's 10 million, but it's coming over seven years, so it's like one point something million. So you'd expect the field officer to get that in. That's the current year expected value. Two concepts there. One's for a pool, one's for an individual. And then if, you, if you're actually soliciting, since you're only going to close one and three, you'd like the ask levels to be three times the current year expected value, so you'll actually will get the current year expected value, which is mathematically what you expect to get. So that's the Cliff Notes. There's an entire webinar on this, um, which if you email me back after this, it's up on our website, uh, Advisor Solutions Webinars, it's up there. Um, otherwise, uh, just let me know and I'll, if you can't find it, I'll get you the link to it. But that's something, uh, you know, a number of the consulting firms, uh, again, bring up Martz and Lundy. I mean, this is something that we do in concert with them. Um, we've had clients um, where they'll lay this out conceptually and then we can operationalize it. So it goes into displays and charts like this that can be used by the team. When it's calculating expected yield, do you assist the current advisor with the client with the calculation? Are there more than one way in calculating expected yield based on the data? Yeah. Um, Two great questions. Yes, so we, this is where our business consultants come in because, you know, this is tricky stuff. We've done it a lot. If you just bought software and tried to do this, uh, getting the data untangled and organized in this way is tough, and then trying to figure out the weighting factors. So we've, we, we have predictive modeling, which we, our, our philosophy and our goal is to empower teams to do it on their own. But when we're setting one of these up, we'll use that to figure out the weighting factors and how things go together. And we also need to do, especially in this ask versus expected value, we need to do some tests to see if it puts to the past history because clients and schools are different. Um, and the, you know, the capacity ratings can be skewed uh, too high, too low. It depends what the wealth screener is. It depends what research did with it, you know. So, yeah, this is directional. When we actually deploy one of these, there's a lot of tuning to get it to align with the nuances of, of a client. And, and it's a thing we do. So like, we're a software company, but we're also highly services oriented and can put one of these in turnkey all the way through working with the team to use it. Two part question. Can you talk about how you get people to understand on tree maps, bubble charts, and other unfamiliar chart types? <laughs> we have trouble getting people to understand anything other than a bar chart. In addition, any advice for switching people from looking at paper reports to viewing them interactively on a screen? Uh, yeah, two really good questions. So when I went through this, I mean, the heat map, this is a multi-dimensional display, right? It, it's got size, it's got color, we can add some of these charts, we can add shapes, so we can have a lot of things on it. Um, this is solicitation levels version two. So if the heat map isn't connecting, you can put in a bar chart, you can use like two bar charts side by side. Um, so Anybody, yeah, anybody with these graphical displays, um, when you push it out to a team, you need to be cognizant of the capacity and, and the, 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 just the human factors issues of the team. So, yeah, we've got teams that don't even like the bar chart, so we'll do more with lists. I mean, they're all, all the same thing. Um, and we've got clients who have gone, you know, from more textual lists to bars, and over time, the heat maps and the bubble charts, you know, like in one view, tell an entire story. And, Generally, you know, we found maybe senior management can grasp those things better if they're visual. Um, 
because it's like a picture and you can walk with it and take it away whereas you know for them to like figure out this list is just so yeah a great question um, and it goes 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 back and forth uh, what was the second part of the question of oh, the paper reports yeah <laughs> uh, that ha yeah so we've got clients you can pop in our world, if you have it up on the screen, you can pop the storyline out into a PowerPoint and send that around or print it or whatever. Um, mostly, you know, if you look what I just went through here in this presentation, I kind of scenario role played it. I mean, this is best in a room with people talking. And it's best in a room where people are talking and asking questions. I mean, this is, I'm in a static version of PowerPoint, but if it was live, you know, this question, what's John Brown? You click on John Brown. What's his movement through stages? Well, that drives a discussion. So, the inter the on the on the computer version gives you this interactivity, so you can drill down and follow up and answer questions immediately. Obviously, on paper, you haven't thought of it ahead. It's not in the deck; they don't get it. Here, you can actually do it on the fly and you know, follow up in PowerPoint or paper after the meeting. Um, so, I guess it's a long rambling answer to say, yes, yeah, some people like paper. Um, you can pop these things in the PowerPoint pretty easily, but for cultivating these coaching sessions and discussions, part of it's the dialogue and it's the drill down. Like I'm, I'm in a PowerPoint, but if you want to see who are these two, you could click on them, and you, the list would be those two. You know, the two prospects. You know, who are the ones in here? Click on it, and you get the list. So that interactivity is part of the coaching discussion process that just doesn't happen with paper. But again. Any of you doing this kind of thing, you know, the responding to the user community where they are in a form they can consume is really important. And including this expected value thing we just spent some time talking about, we've got clients where we will not put that in because the senior management, it's it's not where they want to go. And they're totally focused on visits, you know, this fiscal year, in, today and last month. And we're trying to get them to move to like a 12-month moving period and penetration. If we throw a heat map with expected value in, it's going to lose the point. We have cases, several cases, where we get there in time, but it's part of you throw too much, too many concepts, too many visuals out, and you know we're a visualization company. Um, you will lose the team. It's more important to get the team on small increments. You, know, you need a vision. We're moving them from here to there. And you want to get them in steps. Uh, and if you push it too fast and they don't use it and they fall off, uh, you have, you're not going to get them from here to there. So that's a part of the implementation. Is the, in the movement chart, what's the meaning of the diameter of the circles? Yeah, the diameter is the uh, expected, uh, it's the ask amount. So uh, back to wherever the thing is. So like this circle out here, which I highlighted, it's big because it's a $10 million proposal ask amount. And again, since it's in cultivation, it's an estimated ask. It's actually not yet an actual solicitation. And the reason we do that is you can look at this thing and say, I've got an awful lot of my estimated potential revenues down here um, with a lot less of it up here. Uh, a couple big ones came through, and the verbal commits are the small ones. So that's an issue. Um, I may have a lot of potential revenue here, but it's, it's kind of the low stages. Again, this, this chart is a multi-dimensional chart. It's actually, and somebody could ask, what's the coloring? The coloring is the field officer. So you know, somebody, and it's probably, I think it was Talia, one of them, has an awful lot of stuff stuck down here. Uh, the big ones are the same field officer. You can adjust what the size is and the colors. Part of what story are you trying to um, bring out? And you know, generally, it's the revenue and the field officer and the motion. And so this chart allows you to see all of that. On the presentation, penetration chart is the height of the band representing the proportional number of prospects assigned versus the total assigned prospects. Yeah, shift back there for a minute. So if you look at Heather Ashford, so the question is, what's the sizing here? The uh, width, the width is the total count, which is how many prospects she has assigned. So you can sort of see she's got 143. I think on Kimberly Lloyd's, she's like 125. The prior chart had the actual number we could put on here as well, but she's about the same. And John Brown's got more. Uh, here's, you know, Alicia's got more. So the width is telling you how many they have. And then the, how far up the color goes is what percent have been penetrated. 
with this being the target of 80, and this I think is 70, is like in the low end of it. So Heather Ashford has a 78.3% penetration level because 112 of her 143 have been in one of these four steps, visited uh, proposal and visited, proposal not visited, visited the last 12 months or contacted. And so that's how the numbers play in. And, you know, you could also put this, you know, in a list. Um, you could put it in bar charts. But this this one chart, you know, tells a story about penetration. And what you care about is what's under these target lines and what about all this gray? Because the gray is literally uncovered potential. Uh, I mean, this person, uh, Callie, we actually saw she had a, I think she had a bunch stuck in stage one, but she's also not getting to many of them. Um, I mean, she, she's got about the same number as John Brown, but uh, she's penetrated, you know, including contacts, 30% of them. And if you look at the visits, which is this amount, she's got like 15% of them. That's horrible. So these are just, you know, if nothing's happened in a year, uh, they're pretty dead. Uh, so that's, the graph kind of lets you see things in context and have that kind of a discussion. See, we're approaching the 1 o'clock. We've got a few more questions we can take. We currently have prospect pools with three to 500. Suggestions on bringing management on board with lower prospect pools, which could enable DOs to be more successful. Uh, so we, that's this chart. So we, one, so if, if these are, you know, we've got these at three to 500. Well, there's a couple of questions. Uh, you know, are these high end annual givers where you can do more marketing to them and it's less in depth in person, you know, cultivation. If, but if you're talking about, you know, um, major giving where you're talking, you know, pick a number, 100,000, 500,000, whatever the level is and up, you're not talking about the 5,000, 20, 10,000, 15,000 givers. Um, you do not want these at three to 500. And what you could do is split them into A and B. So the A would be the ones like in here, uh, John Brown's got, you know, these are the highest capacity, most engaged. He's actually, he doesn't have a lot of the lower capacity, but you could say, uh, Joseph Haber, you could say, here's your A group, the high capacity, here's your B group. Uh, I want to see you focus on the A group. And so he's got three to 500, but you're managing him around, you know, the, the 100 to 150 that are the best. Yeah, because, and, and maybe he's going to, it's sort of like somebody somebody's looking at the rest of the pool. Usually, it's prospect research, prospect management. So, if because um, he can say, um, Joe Joseph Haber can say, you know, uh, I want to swap some of these out there, and they're not going anywhere. And prospect research can do that, or he can. So there's different ways, but you obviously have a a pool that is not assigned and a pool that's assigned. And if the assignment levels are at that 300 to 500 level, uh, either Half of them should be given the prospect research, or I would give uh, jo Joseph uh, an A and a B and really manage them to the A level, which would be this group. Yeah, but you see that a lot. And over time, I mean, management needs to understand that it's not, that there, are not there are exceptions, uh, but most human beings can't, you know, manage a pool of 300 with the level of depth that's required to get somebody to make a million dollar, a $500,000, $10 million donation. How do the stage and penetration levels work together? Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm in a PowerPoint, but they um, they're actually separate concepts. So, you know, the penetration is literally, um, you know, I, I want to see am I getting to people. The uh, stage moves is are they actually moving? So you could be getting to people having continued contact. I, I think we saw this with um, we could drill in, but but if, if I'm continually having contacts and they're stuck in qualification and cultivation, that's a separate issue. Like wh why am I, even though I'm having the appropriate level of contact with my pool, I'm not getting it forward. You know, so they can be related or, or often they're distinct distinct things going on. It's a different problem. Um, than, than reaching people, it's another issue to then how to move them forward and, and different different skills, different you know, professional development and things would come into play there. So I, I actually generally would think of them as potentially related but more distinct. When looking at penetration, do you look at context outside of the portfolio or only in their portfolio? Yeah, penetration, the concept here is I own this pool and this is for my pool. So 
um, if I may, if actually if you looked at the data here, uh, go back here, I mean uh, the visit part. So I know for a fact that some of these people, like Nancy Berrios actually has made visited on other people's clients, but those visits count for the other people, not for Nancy Berrios. And so, um, you know, if you're looking at bringing a prospect pool forward, it's great that Nancy's helping somebody else out, but she's responsible for her pool. We actually had this discussion at one of our clients where uh, you had people hitting visits by just visiting people who weren't even screened by prospect research. So they were doing these visits completely outside of their pool and, and getting great feedback. You're doing all these visits. That, that actually shouldn't count. I mean, it's more you own these 100 people. Your job is to move them through these stages and get them to make a gift in a reasonable time period. And if they're not, you know, screen them out and, and get go to research and get a new one. So. Um, and again, and this the way we would do the data, if Nancy made you know a bunch of visits on John Brown's, John would John's penetration would be higher and Nancy wouldn't, you know, her her prospects maybe weren't visited. And we think that's the right way to do that. Yeah, see we're reaching the two o'clock. Uh, there's a lot of other questions here. Uh, we will you know, this has been recorded and we will get it out to all of you within the week and we will come back to those questions that weren't answered um, in email over the, the next few days as we get to them. So really rich topic. You know, this is our area of expertise. Um, love the questions. Um, I'd say the dialogue, except that, you know, the questions came in by email, so it wasn't much of a dialogue. But we love talking about this stuff. We've got a lot of expertise in it. And if I was to close with one concept, it's back to the beginning. You know, this, this should be uh, coaching tips to help tell stories, to highlight best practices, to move a team forward. Using these things as good and bad thresholds will turn people away from them. And um, there's a lot of really good best practices on how to do that. Um, and uh, we're here to help. So uh, thank you for your time. I uh, appreciate it and have a great rest of the day.